Dorothy Blanchard's life has been a blessing to countless people, a life filled with joyful exuberance. It all began in 1918 when Alvina Schlemmer and August Larson fell in love and were married in 1921. The result was a little bundle of joy who they named Dorothy. She was born on March 11, 1921. Here she is as a one-year-old child. She was a happy, fun-loving toddler. Here she is on Dewey, the family horse. She recounts the fond memories of those days. And the one thing that I remember about living on that farm was that there was a little rabbit sitting in the yard and Grandpa Larson told me that if I put salt on his tail, I could catch him. And so <clears throat> I just kept running after that little rabbit trying to put salt on his tail and I never caught him. <laughs> That's what I remember about living on the farm. When Dorothy was five years old, her mom and dad and sisters, Helen and Marion, moved to a farm down the road that her dad had purchased. Dorothy and her two sisters loved to play on that farm. Another game that we used to play was Andy Andy Over. And we used the house to throw the ball over. <laughs> We also, we also like to <clears throat> walk along the creek, go out to the back of the farm, and then we'd climb the trees. There was a little grove of trees at the end, and I remember I would ask Grandma Larson for a sandwich, and then I'd climb up in one of the trees and eat my sandwich. <laughs> and and the crick, uh, as far as Grandma Larson was concerned, was an absolute no-no. And we were always sneaking down there to wade in it. And then <laughs> invariably, one of us would fall in. And then we'd all get a licking with a shingle. <laughs> I had two sisters and we would be given a quarter, and that quarter was enough to go to the Strand Theater and get a Sunday afterwards at Marcusi's. And uh, we'd love to go and see the serials uh, of uh, Tarzan. That's the one that I remembered. He was always left falling off a cliff at the end of the week and we wouldn't be able to wait until the next week to see what was going to happen next. Dorothy spent 40 years teaching children to read. That love began in her heart before she even started school. Well, when I was a little girl, I always watched Grandpa Larson read the cowboy magazines. I don't remember what the names of the magazines were, but he always read all the cowboy magazines and the cowboy stories, and I wish that I could read them too. So I didn't go to kindergarten. I went immediately to first grade because I didn't have kindergarten at our consolidated school. But in six weeks, I was able to read the newspaper. <coughs> and so, um, then whenever the newspaper would come, I would read it, and there were so many words I could pronounce, but I didn't know the meanings of. And one of the words that I was really puzzled about was injured. I was reading that everybody was injured, and I finally asked Grandma Larson what that meant and found out. And then I started reading um, Grandpa Larson's cowboy uh, magazines. <clears throat> and I thought those stories were just wonderful because that was the only thing I had access to, you know. And then when I got older, I would buy True Romance. <laughs> and I read those stories. I soon began to realize once I w uh, went on through the grades that there were better things in the world to read than cowboy stories and True Romance. And so then I, I just have had a lifelong love of reading. And I think it started when I was little because I wanted to read so much because I saw my dad reading all the time. 
For 12 years, Dorothy went to Avira Consolidated Schools. Every day, she and her sisters would board the school bus, and she was ready for more school time adventures. She remembered her first boyfriend, Glenn Dirks. And one of the other things, Glenn Dirks was my boyfriend in first grade. And one time, he and I pumped up together in the swing, you know, you stand up. And we pumped up so high that the swing jerked. And I fell out and landed on my back on the ground and I couldn't breathe for a little while. And I never pumped up with him again. <laughs> Despite such mishaps, Dorothy grew into a lovely young woman. Here she is pictured with her two sisters. She enjoyed high school particularly because of the love of drama. And her favorite teacher was Dorothy Sesser. Dorothy got such good grades in high school that she graduated as salutatorian in her class. What next? Now, the, the year that I graduated from high school, I decided that I wanted to be a teacher because I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> it's really the truth. And so, I, at that time, you could go to Mount St. Clair College for 13 weeks in the summer and then become a teacher in the country schools and so that's what I did. When I graduated from high school I went to Mount St. Clair College in Clinton, Iowa and I went 13 weeks. I uh, had gotten a job in the previous spring at the Sunshine School a mile south of the 10 mile because my dad happened to know the director really well and so he said I could have the job and there were 69 people who applied for the job but I got it because my dad knew the director. She lived with the bosses at 10 Mile Corner while she taught at Sunshine School. She walked a mile every day except when it rained. Then one of the students' father would come by and pick up Dorothy and her eight students in a horse-drawn wagon. Here is Dorothy with Unique Schwartz and Evita. In 1940, she moved to Plugtown to teach. Here, her class was much larger, 31 in size, and she had the added responsibility of starting and stoking a fire each day. But it was well worth it now that she was getting $75 a month instead of $65 a month. In 1943 to 1946, Dorothy taught the primary grades at Low Moor. But could such a lovely lass remain single, school marm forever? Well, I met him at a dance. My mother and I, it was on a Friday evening, and there was a wedding anniversary dance at the German Hall in Clinton, and my mother and dad insisted that I go. I really wanted to stay home because I was too tired to go, but I went, and so then I sat along the side, and my dad finally came over and he said, Honey, is there anything I could do for you? So you'd have a good time, and I said, I just saw this handsome captain walk in the uh, door of the of the hall, and I said, yes, you can get me an invitation. I mean, a, you can get me an introduction to that handsome captain. He just walked in the door, and a few minutes later, I met him, and we danced, and he took me home that evening, and. Um, then I didn't see him again for about seven months because every time he'd call, I'd be gone. It's the story of my life. <laughs> and uh, so we finally dated, and then the next June we were married. Mm -hmm. Dorothy married that handsome captain May 9th, 1946. After her marriage, John and Dorothy moved to Iowa City where he worked on his master's degree in engineering and Dorothy taught in a small school six miles from Iowa City until they left in 1948. They didn't know they were going to have twins. And when the nurse came in to tell John, he congratulated the man on his left. No, the nurse said, you had twins. John quickly called up his mother and said, you've got two cute little dishwashers, Ma. These two cute little dishwashers really kept John and Dorothy busy, even though they didn't get a full night's sleep for three months. Carla and Marcia did become the delight and joy to John and Dorothy. Tragedy struck, though, in May 29, 1950, breaking up a happy foursome when John suddenly passed away of a cerebral hemorrhage. Dorothy was a woman of God in the midst of a trial. 
She had her girls to take care of and to live for. She rose to the challenge. For a short while, she moved to her folks' farm and then bought a home on 12th Avenue where she and the girls moved in 1951. With the girls to support, Dorothy decided to go back to school. When the girls went to first grade, she went to work as a second grade teacher at Jefferson School, promising the superintendent that she would finish her BA by going to school at night, summers, and weekends. Here, Dorothy is on a field trip with her second graders, a train trip to Clinton to do it. She always had a heart for children and was an excellent teacher. Superintendent R.T. Graw nominated her for Teacher of the Year Award because she always was able to help children with reading problems. She finished her BA degree at Mary Crest College, going nights, Saturdays, and summer sessions. When she wasn't teaching or taking care of her girls, she was studying. These were busy years. Dorothy was not just a teacher and a student herself, but a housewife and a mother of two girls. She was their constant friend and companion. Here she is teaching them to ride a tricycle. Dorothy bought them roller skates on their third birthday. She hid behind the dining room curtains to watch them slip and slide. She supported them in their extracurricular activities, driving Carla to cheerleading engagements. Here, proud mama snaps a picture of the pretty girls going to their first dance. She took them on vacation each summer to Brainerd, Minnesota. Dorothy and the girls went out fishing for sunfish. Then Carla, the brave one, knocked it over its head and scaled them for dinner. Dorothy even found time to relax herself on these trips. Dorothy opened her home to a menagerie of the girls' pets, from local squirrels to bunnies and cats. Well, then another time I gave you 50 cents and I told you that you could go downtown and buy anything you wanted to. You and Carla could just walk downtown because you didn't know what to do. So you came home with a little ice cream carton and I said, oh, you bought some ice cream with your 50 cents. They said, no, Ma, look at what we bought. And you opened the, the carton and boing, <laughs> a green chameleon jumped out and landed on the curtain. And that chameleon, finally, I got so tired of him hopping all over the house. I said, well, I think you better take him outside and play with him. So you took him outside, and of course, chameleons change color with whatever they land on. And so he decided to land on the tree, and before you could grab him, he was way up the tree. And so you were starting to cry, and I ran out there. And... Uh, I said, well, that'll make, he'll make a good meal for the birds. And oh, you both just cried. And we never got the chameleon back because you couldn't see him. He was gone forever. <laughs> that terrible? Do you remember that? But none was more special than Kitty. Carla brought her home a tiny round ball of fur with two big innocent eyes. Dorothy declared, no more cats. But the tears welled up in Carla's eyes. She softly said, okay, you can keep her. Kitty lived for 18 happy years, definitely part of the family. Keeping their pets was only part of motherhood. Dorothy loved and supported Carla and Marcia in all that they did. Dorothy helped the girls in their college careers. She took, took part in their sorority activities. Here she is at mother and daughter tea. Dorothy attended their many activities with the youth group. Here is a singing engagement and a skit at a talent show, which made her laugh so hard she cried. She always was a great audience. 1958 brought another big change in Dorothy's life. Harold Blanchard, who had been a colleague in the teaching profession, became a close friend and friendship blossomed into romance and they were married on August 3rd, 1968. Doc Blanchard always had a funny joke or a lighthearted story that would lighten things up. Among the many activities they enjoyed together were the trips to Canada. Dorothy turned out to be the best fisherman in the group. Here she is holding the catch of the day. One time she caught the biggest walleye of the season, which she had stuffed and hung on the dining room wall. She always felt a little guilty, she said. Really, I should have let Harold catch that big fish. Dorothy survived a few other close calls in the Canadian wilderness. We were at Gull Rock Bay and we had a cabin down by the lake. And anyway, I was sleeping on a cot near the door, and all of a sudden I heard somebody 
knock on the door. And I said, Harold, Harold, wake up, wake up. There's somebody at the door. What, what, what? So he jumps out of bed and he goes to the door. He turned on the light and there was a bear with both of his paws against the door glass and his head looking in. He was looking all around our cabin. And I sat up in bed and I was so scared I couldn't move. And I said, Harold, do something. So he got the broom and he went over, starting over to the door. He says, you get out of here. And that made the bear angry. And suddenly the bear took both of his paws hit the glass of the door and the glass flew all over my bed all over the room and then Harold just went after him with the broom and he ran down and he got in the weeds right just a few feet from our door and he would not leave you could not make him leave because Harold had poured the grease that we fried the fish in in the reeds and it made the bears come and see, that bear was looking for food in our cabin. And if we hadn't been there, you know, he'd have gotten in probably. He'd just break the glass and they go in, they wreck everything. Grandma Dorothy was a favorite of her grandchildren on so many occasions. Birthdays, parties, creating stories, Hawaiian vacations, dancing the hula, tickling, eating candy, playing house, graduating, getting married, great-grandchildren, receiving Emmys, family portraits, eating out, and carnival rides. Grandma Dorothy, all the memories we had from some river to Hawaii. You're so great. Probably the strongest yet kindest person I know. Your daughters turned out great. And even above teaching, I believe that raising them was your greatest work. Your life has been and always will be a glory to God. Love you, Grandma. Dorothy loved her friends. She loved getting together to play golf. Here's the country club gang. She loved eating together with her friends. She loved celebrating Christmas with her friends. She loved playing bridge with her friends. She loved talking with her friends and singing with them, smiling with them, hugging them, laughing together, posing together, and praying together. Dear Mama, we sat today thinking about all the things throughout your life that made you, for us, the most wonderful mother in the world. You had incredible courage when Daddy died. You didn't feel sorry for yourself. You set your heart to take care of us. And you didn't blame God. I don't think any thoughts of bitterness about Daddy's death even crossed your mind. At least you never verbalized any to us. We thus had an open heart toward God and faith that our Father was in heaven. You stayed home with us while we were little. You could have worried about money so much that you would have started work or school right away. But you trusted God to make the money stretch, and he did. You were both mother and father to us, working, going to school, taking care of two children and a house. You were such an example of diligence and hard work. I remember the time you slammed your finger in the car door and still went to work the next day in terrible pain. You wouldn't think of not doing your job. You had integrity above and beyond the call of duty. You showed to Carl and I, as well as anyone who came to our house, a heart of love and tenderness you had such a heart of compassion, which extended even to animals. Do you remember the tiny baby bunny that we nurtured to health and who then lived in our backyard afterward? And of course, Kitty, even a crippled mangy kitten thrived in our household, surrounded by love and tender loving care. You always thought the best of us and were a source of constant encouragement. I remember doing that ridiculous science project in which I got a cow's heart and tried to make it beat with electricity, but all I ended up doing was spilling formaldehyde on my black velvet jumper. 
but you always saw the best and you said, you did a wonderful job. Do you remember when I first was going to teach a class of 28 fourth grade children? And I was totally petrified. You took me on an hour walk holding my hand and encouraged me, you can do it, you said, and I did. You have given us wonderful fun memories. I'll never forget our trips to Minnesota where we caught sunfish. Carla knocked them over the head with an oar and cleaned them. That's where I saw a walking stick and screamed at the top of my voice. You thought something terrible had happened, but it was just this brief encounter with a harmless bug. We all ended up having a great laugh. And you always have prayed for us faithfully. Eternity will show, I'm sure, your prayers saved us from great disasters, car accidents, cults, and diseases. Thank you, Mama, for being Jesus to Carla and Marsha.